Okay, we're about to begin. Good morning. I'm John Larson. I'm the ranking Democrat on the Ways and Means Committee on the Social Security uh, Subcommittee. And I'm honored to be here this morning with the AFL-CIO and its affiliated members um, and can't thank you enough. You know, I wear this pin all the time. It's a pin of uh, President Kennedy. And uh, it was President Kennedy who said, the AFL-CIO is the people's lobby. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly right, you know, uh, uh, Everett, thank you. And it's the people's lobby because of what you do on behalf of working class Americans. But you do it for all mm. Americans. That's right. You are the lobby for the people. Right. And never have the American people needed you to bring awareness to what's happening here in Congress and especially as it relates to the so-called fiscal commission. Uh, I want to commend Senator Wyden, who said, I want everybody to know when they hear the words fiscal commission, that means cut, 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 cut to Social Security yeah. and Medicare and federal employees. Yes. We are well aware of that. But to the general public, when they hear the debt and deficit in a fiscal commission, they say, what could be wrong with that? Well, you know, as they say, you got to read between the lines and read the details. Yes, sir. What do you think if uh, you had a commission of 16 people. Now, in both, in the Congress, we have a body of 535 people, 100 senators and 435 members of the House. And yet in this commission proposal, they're going to propose that there's 16 people on the commission, four of whom are non-voting, but they're so-called experts. And then six from the House, and six from the Senate, three Democrats, three Republicans in both chambers, but then seven people get to determine the future of Social Security, Medicare, and countless other programs under the guise that they're doing this to create a greater understanding of our debt and deficit. Everybody in this room should know, and I want to commend Social Security Works and the Committee to Preserve and Protect Social Security, who've been out there along with more than 300 organizations saying, hey, wait a minute here. First of all, Social Security has nothing to do with the national debt. It is paid for. That's right. Thank the People's Lobby for making all Americans aware of this. Right. Why? Right. It's an earned benefit. Yes, sir. It is not an entitlement, as our colleagues on the other side would like to equate this somehow to welfare. Mm. But it is an earned benefit and it's the number one anti-poverty program for the elderly and for children as well. Roosevelt was a genius. He saw what was needed. And ever since then, people have been of the mind. You may recall that George Bush decided he thought they might want to privatize this. And who stood up and stopped that from happening? Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi led the charge, yep. but it was the AFL-CIO mm -hmm. that was there to make sure 
that people understood what a drastic mistake it was. Yes, sir. Now imagine this. The last time Social Security was enhanced, Richard Nixon was President of the United States more than 50 years ago. So it's been over 50 years since the programs and its benefits have been enhanced. Yeah, some will say, well, no, wait a minute, we get a COLA. But even the ARP and others have already stated, no, 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 that's not a good COLA. The formula is flawed. We need to change that. And Democrats have put forward an agenda to do just that. But over 50 years since Congress has acted to enhance Social Security? Mm. Meanwhile, there's now with, you ready for this one? 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security. Wow. We will be over 70 million recipients. And the program hasn't been enhanced in over 50 years. And in the midst of that, the Republican solution, if you read their study committee, is to cut benefits across the board. How so? By raising the age. Mm, 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 mm. Well, as you all know, for every year you raise the age, that's a 7% cut in benefits. Mm. So if you're going from 67 to 70, that's a 21% cut in benefits. Now they say, well, it's logical. People are living longer. Well, yes, people are living longer. But how does it make any sense that if you're living longer, you're going to be able to live on less. Mm. <laughs> so that's why your engagement and fight is so important. And where is that fight going to take place? It's got to take place in this Capitol with every member understanding the consequences of what can happen. Twelve members? go behind closed doors. Oh, they say in the legislation they're going to have hearings, but not on anything specific in the bill. In fact, nobody gets to know what's in that bill until after they voted on it. And then it automatically goes to both floors for an up or down vote that's unamendable. Doesn't that sound very democratic to you so far? <laughs> and as I said, they put the money in there to advertise what their results are going to be through the media to try to convince the public that this is the way to go. Nothing is more undemocratic. We need hearings out in the open on mm. specific proposals yes. so the public can yes. see yes. what's going on That's and right. everybody can add to that. Yes. We are a body of 435 people. Yes, sir. The Senate is a body of 100 people. We have a pro How about we do something unusual in Congress? We actually <laughs> vote, actually vote yes, on Social Security and yes, Medicare. Yes, sir. How about people do their job? And then, oh, yes, they say, well, we need to have people come together. Yes, we do. That's called a conference committee. Yeah, yeah. That's called a conference committee. And you come yeah, together yeah. and you sort through your differences after you have debated in public. Yes, sir. And the public has had a chance to provide input. And then we make a decision. Mm -hmm. We know where the American people are. We don't need a commission. We know that Social Security needs to be fixed. So yes, they should probably call this commission the commission to slash benefits. Mm. Uh, again, I'm proud of the president 
and the White House for coming out and say this results, it's tantamount to passing a death panel. Because that will be the impact on so many Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of Social Security alone, more than 40% of all the recipients of Social Security, that is the only benefit they have. Mm. Democrats are proposing on several fronts enhancing benefits for everyone, making sure that no one can no longer retire into poverty after having paid into Social Security all their lives, eliminating WEP and GPO, which has been unfair from the start, and yes, paying for it. Yes, sir. That's right. Making sure that people on Social Security, some 23 million will get a tax cut. How about we talk about average Americans mm -hmm. on Social Security retired in desperate need of help getting a tax cut instead of major corporations and that's wealthy right. people. That's right. That's, that's why, right. Yeah. that's why President Biden was right when he says we've got to lift the cap. Mm. How many Americans even know that there's a cap on Social Security? <laughs> We're gonna lift the cap on people over 400,000. Now let me ask you a question. We did this the other day, right, Evan? Okay, all right. Raise your hand if you're making more than $400,000. <laughs> oh, wow, well, shocked. Well, what? <laughs> I don't think there's a hand that went up here. I've yet to be in any forum, public or otherwise, where I've asked that question where anyone's hand has gone up. Bottom line is this. It impacts a very small group of people and frankly, a number of them, when they've been questioned about it, said, I have no problem paying my fair share. I'm an American. Right, right. I'm an American. Yes. And this is our number one insurance program, the number one anti-poverty benefit for the elderly and for our children. And as all of you know, it's not just pensions. It's disability and its spousal and dependent coverage. It also is, and I say this to my Republican colleagues all the time, and we've got to pick up this mantle, the number one economic development program that we could pursue, the number one program that we could pursue to close the wealth gap. Mm. The average benefit a Social Security gets for a male is 18000 and a female is 14000 mm -hmm. Nobody's getting wealthy on Social Security. No. <laughs> Nobody's going out and buying stock options with the Social Security check. Oh. They are spending it right back in the districts, congressional districts that they live in. That's why it's the most important economic development plan. Right. Speaker Johnson has 158,009 Social Security recipients in his district. His district gets $233 million monthly that goes to those recipients. Where do they spend that? Mm. Right back in their district. That's right. right back at the local grocery store, at the pharmacy, paying for their rent or paying off their mortgages but it becomes the economic development plan that's needed and the money's going directly to people. So that money is all coming right back into yeah. our economy. Yes, there is never a reason to apologize for this and it doesn't do anything to our national debt because it is paid for. Yeah. So I'm grateful to be here with you today. And I thank everybody for joining us and uh, for your work because as President Kennedy noted, you are the people's lobby. Mm. And it's gonna take this kind of effort to both stave off this so-called fiscal commission and then focus on saying, if you've got a plan Put it out there. That's right. <laughs> Let's have a vote yeah. on those plans. Yes, sir. And where do you stand after 
more than 50 years of neglect? Are you for cutting benefits or enhancing and improving them? All right. And then let's do it the good old fashioned way. Let's have a vote. <laughs> you got a better idea, put it forward. We're happy to put our ideas out there yes, and sir. to do it in the open and in public yes. so people get an up or down vote. Yes, sir. But now the question is making sure that this commission doesn't slide itself in to one of those must pass bills that are circulating right now currently. So the next several days are gonna be vitally important as we approach the March 1st deadline again for whether government's gonna stay open or not. That's right. And so we have to be eternally vigilant. No one has been more so than Robert Graves. Awesome. My good colleague and friend has been on from the start, Social Security 2100. And the input that we have received from the AFL-CIO and all the affiliated organizations is what has been, comprised the very basics of our bill and why it's so important that before there's even a vote on a plan that changes and enhances Social Security and makes it solvent into the future, that we stop this clandestine, subterranean, behind closed doors commission that requires an up or down vote and no amendments. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Robert Roach, the President of the Alliance Retired Americans, 4.4 million seniors throughout this country. And we are here to speak about protecting retirees who are the most vulnerable group in America. These are the people that have raised families. These are people who are still taking care of families because children are coming home because they can't get the good job and all that stuff. And children have to come home to take care of mom and dad in some cases and is not, who are not financially stable. This is a benefit that was paid into by these people, by all of us, and now they want to take it away. But if they take it away, it's not taken away from individuals, it's taken away from the family. And when you take away from the family, you adversely impact the family for progressing to the next step. Mm -hmm. And their children. And what is happening is, with the, with the situations where people have been systematically left behind, this commission will take them further behind. People who have not kept pace with the economy because the CPI doesn't meet the standards of today. People who have Social Security has been taken up, web, taken away from people. So these are the people who have worked hard, paid their dues, lived by the rules, and now they're being told there's going to be a secret meeting to figure out what happens to them. No secret meetings. We want to know who's voting and what they're voting for so we can hold them accountable right. at the ballot box. Right. This whole idea of the secret meeting is to insulate certain people who want to vote against us from it being publicly known. No, we want to know what they're doing. We want to know who's standing with us. We want to know who's against us so we can take the appropriate action and get some new people. Yeah. Okay? So either we get this done now, either we stop this foolishness now, we must take to the phones, emails, whatever it is that you do, to legally and peacefully oppose this foolishness. Okay? This is just something to say. Let me tell you, one of the most financially uh, geniuses of our times, a guy named Warren Buffett. You may have heard of Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. In 2005, they went to Warren Buffett and said, how do you, how can we fix Social Security? Make it he said, scrap the cap, take that limit off. It fixes the problem. We all know this. There's been studies on this. We can scrap that cap. We can lift benefits for the, the most important people, the people at the bottom, lift from the bottom. And then we can increase the benefits and it'll be solvent for the next 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. This is not brain surgery. 
This is just an idea so we have to, so people can avoid doing what's right by the people. I want to thank Congressman Larson for being a champion, for coming to our meetings, talking to members, and being out there. And I want to say publicly that Congressman Larson speaks for the 4.4 million members of the Alliance Retired Americans. We stand with Congressman Larson today. We will stand with him tomorrow until this job is done. He's our friend. I can't give you any more details than he gave you. I can only tell you the time to fight is now. now. Yeah. And the time to stand up to all these people, to all these people who want to secretly vote against us. I was shocked the other day when it came out of that the congressman said, listen, I haven't had a raise in so many years. We need a raise from $174,000 a year. What about the people on Social Security who haven't had a decent raise in so many years? What about the people who pay their salary for so many years? So, Congressman, I want you to know we stand with you today, and we will continue to stand with you. And it's timely now that we get to work, that we stand and get to work and get out there and do what we have to do, as we've been doing with our launch. Maybe you've seen some of the stuff we've been putting out for my executive director, Rich Fiesta, every day, every other day, getting the stuff out there. We're, on, we're in the fight. We ask others to join, us, join in the fight. But I would like to now introduce our next speaker, a friend, a colleague, and a lifelong advocate for organized labor, for civil rights, and, and the course for federal workers. I pass the mic over to AFGE President Everett Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Attorney. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. I'd like to take this privilege, though, if you don't mind, first of all, to recognize uh, members of AFGE who has traveled into uh, Washington, D.C. this week from all across the country. Okay, can I just give a shout out to them? Here we go. And at least nine of our executive board members are with us this morning. We appreciate you. But, but I want to endorse the comments from my good friend, Representative John Larson, and the other leaders here today for the uh, 750,000 federal and D.C. government workers that I represent, that our union represent. You know, we have no greater champion in Congress than John Larson. Now, the whole premise of the, this proposed fiscal commission is a sham. Not only is it a sham, it's a disgrace. Contrary to some popular beliefs, Congress does not have much of a spending problem. You know what I said? Congress does not have much of a spending problem. Compared to our great wealth as a nation, our government actually spends less than almost all of our peers. We have fewer civilian federal employees today than in 1960, while the American population has almost doubled. What Congress does have is a revenue problem. Right? Specifically, the present majority extreme unwillingness to make the super rich pay their share. That's a revenue problem. <laughs> Not just this year, but year in and year out. And this is reflective in the growing national debt, right? Since the late 80s, the debt has grown by more than $30 trillion. But the wealth of the wealthiest grow, has grown by more than $40 trillion. Should I say that again? Yeah. I said that since the 80, the debt has grown by more than $30 trillion. But the wealth of the wealthiest has grown by more than $40 trillion. Something's wrong with this picture. Now, that's what our nation's our national treasure has gone, you know, to pay for wars and, you know, other tax cuts after another, while people like our members at FGE and in the AFL-CIO get tax scraps. But when it comes to billionaires, Congress generously truly know no limits. Now, our members know, and they know quite well, they know what a fiscal commission means, right? Because we've lived through that. We've lived through more than one. We lived through more than one kind. We lived through the Simpson Bowl, right? The Brax and all of these sequestration, all of these things that were the results of this fiscal commission, right? The new commission plans mean federal pay freezes. 
What do y'all think about that? A commission means retirement cuts. What do you think about that? A commission means sequestration. What do you think about that? And yes, a commission means devastating cuts to Social Security and Medicare that John Lawson has spent his life carefully defending. And we shall salute him this day for what he's bringing forth. Now, these, my brothers and sisters, are the bedrock programs our middle class members rely on. They have dutifully paid the, into every two weeks for their entire work in life they paid for this. The proposed commission breaks our nation's promise to these patriots who serve the American people. And I pray, I pray diligently that there is no commission. But if God provided there is one, I have a word for our friends on the other side. And here's what I think I speak for all of organized labor. We will work night and day. Are y'all going to work with me? Yeah. We will work night and day and make sure that this commission become exactly the tax trap that conservatives are afraid of. Won't we do it? Yeah. We will work night and day that it votes to, to finally raise revenue from super wealthy individuals and corporations and repeal the Trump tax cut. That's what we'll do. And breaks the, strength, the stranglehold that tax privileged conservatives held for many years in this house. But what we will do, we'll stand up and we'll fight against it with everything in our body. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you'll stand with me. And now I would like to welcome to the stage my friend and my brother, Brother Will Attic. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, my name is Will Attic. I'm the executive director of the Union Veterans Council. We represent 1.3-ish million working veterans across the country right now. And we're an org organization here to fight for America. Uh, when, I, when I signed up to serve my country at 17, I didn't sign up to defend millionaires and billionaires. I raised an oath of, to the Constitution of the United States and our democracy. Yes, sir. Right, and every single one of us. Thank you, Will. Thank you. What I found since I left the military is I get to fight just as hard for the American people by being an advocate for everybody, not just the veterans, but everybody. And you got to understand the veterans community is something that's, that's always supported in the United States, especially from, from the other aisle. They love to talk about how they support us. They love to put little yellow stickers on the back of their cars. They love to take pictures with us, right, Everett? <laughs> yes, sir. They do. Yeah. <laughs> But last year, we had to spend the first half of the year fighting against 22% budget cuts to veterans' benefits. <laughs> We've had to stand up to fight against so many cuts to Social Security and Medicare. People don't realize 14% of all adults that use Social Security are veterans. So when you ta start talking about an undemocratic, in-the-dark commission, we know what that's about. Yes. First of all, that's not democracy. No. We, we have these tools that have been given to us by our founders to be involved. And, and what we've seen right now is people trying to take that power away from the American people. And, and it's shameful. Um, some of the things that we have to think about is, is Medicaid and Medicare. Yes, Again, people don't realize these are taxes that are on the board. Veterans aren't dummies. Uh, the American uh, people uh, aren't dummies. Yes, sir. If, if we have people standing in front of cameras and on the floor of Congress saying that we're going to cut Social Security, we're going to do everything we can to cut Medicaid, I'm going to believe them. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to fight against them, just like yes, Rep. Carson's talking yes, about sir. here. And all my brothers and sisters from organized labor. Yes, this isn't just about cuts to benefits and entitlements. Yes, right. We know every single time the Republicans tar start talking about cutting from federal budgets, that means a tax against workers. And my friends who work at the federal employees, over half a million, almost a half a million veterans, the largest group of disabled veterans in America, work at, the feder at federal agencies. Yes, sir. They're on the line. Yes. Those jobs that allow them to have stability and live the American dream they fought for are on the line because these folks want to take this process into a back room corner mm. and force mm -hmm. things across. What? And you know what? They don't even have to get the bills done. Yeah. What they've got to do is confuse the American people with their backroom dealings that this is the way to do it. Yeah. I, I had a lot more to talk about today, but I want to, I want to end this a little bit personal for me. Um, tomorrow I'm going to drive home to Illinois to take care of my mom. Um, last year she uh, had a really bad stroke. And my mom uh, raised three kids. Um, she, she was married when she was 17, was a housewife. 
Uh, didn't do much work. For the last 10 years, she's lived off of less than $800 a year mm, 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 mm. with massive health problems. $800 a year wow. represent Larson. Wow. An amazing woman, someone I love. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She was able to buy her first house when she was seven, 67. Wow. A very small house, maybe, maybe worth about $20,000 in Southern Illinois. One of the most proudest moments of her life. Yes, sir. Yes. I've got to go home and sell that house. Because she's, she's in, a, in a retirement home. And because of the rules, because of the lack of finances, for her to be able to live in a, in a good facility, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. she's going to have to sell the one thing that brought her so much joy, the proud, the pride of that house. Mm. That's who these folks are attacking. I love you. Right? So I, I want to let you know that the, that the <laughs> veterans from all across this country are ready to fight. Yeah. We don't come from rich families. We come from poor families. We know yes, who we have to fight for. Yes, sir. And we appreciate the fight that's going on in Congress. And yeah. over the next few days, we're going to stop this yes, thing. Yes, sir. We're not going to allow them to. We're going to bring this right. process into the light because yeah. we are going to fight, and we're going to fight really hard. Yeah. Now, I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm very proud to introduce another another amazing person who represents so many veterans across the, across the country. People don't realize one of the largest folks who, who employ veterans across the country are state and local employees. And, and I want to really, uh, my honor to introduce uh, from, from AFG, or from Ask Me, uh, Mary Cannon James, and, and she's going to talk about that. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you, Mary. Right. Good morning. Good On morning. behalf of the 1.4 million members of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Ask Me. It is an honor to stand alongside Congressman Larson and our labor allies today, urging Congress to oppose fiscal commission proposals that would be harmful to workers and their families. My name is Mary Cannon James, and I live in Davenport, Iowa. I am a proud AFSCME retiree, and I am the president of AFSCME Chapter 61 retirees covering the great states of Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas. I am 75 years old and I am still working full time. Let me repeat that. I am 75 years old right. and still working full time. Thank you. Even though, by all accounts, I should be enjoying retirement, spending time with my son, focusing on my health care, being involved with my community. But instead, I am struggling to make ends meet, like so many other retirees that I know. I started working for the state of Iowa while I was in college at 19 years old. I worked and played a meaningful role in the workers' lives in Iowa's as I conducted unemployment insurance hearings. After 35 years, I finally decided to retire. I started, oh, excuse me, my husband Chuck and I looked forward to the next chapter in our life. He also had a good union job with good solid health care benefits and a pension. And despite facing health challenges since youth, I maintained a positive attitude, and I felt that our future was bright in retirement, even though I had undergone open heart surgery, had both hips and wrists replaced due to severe arthritis, and continued to have severe heart problems. Mm. I counted myself lucky, however, because I had access to comprehensive, affordable health care. Mm. And then, in a blink of the eye, my life changed forever. <laughs> On February 11th, 2013, my husband Chuck died in a snowmobile accident at the age of 61. There are no words that will describe that loss. And then, a few years after Chuck passed away, the US Supreme Court stripped away his hard-earned health care benefits for retirees that I depended upon for my insurance in a case known as Case New Holland, CNH, versus Reese. I quickly realized after that that I needed to make final adjustments 
in order to pay my bills and to attend to my health care needs. Therefore, back to work. I am grateful for Social Security and Medicare, but they are not enough to let me cover my bills, mm. which include my supplemental premiums and my health care costs. I had periodontal surgery just recently for a cost of $3,800, and it was not covered by Medicare. I take expensive anti-rejection medications for an artificial heart valve and additional heart and arthritis medications for a cost of $800 to $1,200 a month, depending upon the month. I'm also in physical therapy right now three times a week mm. as I'm waiting for a complete shoulder replacement. Thankfully, insurance and Medicare covers 50% of that, but I pay $135 a week out of pocket. As you can see, medical care quickly escalates. Yes. Social Security helps, but I am barely scraping by to make my house payment, my car payment, pay for my prescriptions, and the bare necessities of life. Mm. And in addition, I have a special needs son that I have to help support. Thank you. Making ends meet is difficult, which why at 75 years old, I am still working for Davenport Schools in the Human Resource Department. But I fear what is going to happen when I'm not able to work. When I learned about the Congress considering a bipartisan proposal to establish a fiscal commission, I was deeply concerned. From where I sat, this is a backdoor way to fast track harmful cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Essential lifelines for the financial stability of so many retirees. Instead of considering measures that could jeopardize the programs that we rely on, Congress should focus on identifying ways to strengthen and protect Medicare and Social Security. These programs are not just numbers on a budget. They are vital for my well-being and those of so many retirees. A balanced approach is needed to solve our nation's economic concerns. But I urge policymakers to consider alternatives that don't reflect on a deficit-focused approach, which could be cuts to childcare, nutrition, workforce training, and public health. I do support proposals that require corporations and the wealthy to pay their fair share, rather than relying solely on spending cuts to crucial programs <clears throat> that the retirees depend upon. The potential cuts to key programs are not just abstract concepts. They directly affect retirees and their families. I believe Congress should identify policies that address the nation's fiscal issues without jeopardizing the well-being of retirees. We need a thoughtful approach that ensures financial stability for everyone, not just the right. privileged few. That's right. But the Fiscal Commission is not it. Thank you. Right. I would like to introduce Secretary Treasurer Ingram from the FT. Thank you. How good is it? Good morning. Good afternoon, right? Or good morning. It's a good, good afternoon somewhere. Yeah. Listen, thank you, Mary, uh, and the Green Machine for being here. We appreciate AFSCME uh, for being here. Thank you, Representative Larson, for being our champion today. We appreciate you for shining a light on this particular issue. I want to thank my good friend Everett Kelly, who spoke so strongly that he shut the lights off <laughs> in this place. Uh, our veterans, mail handlers, our retired Americans, um, I find joy today because I'm standing with friends. Yeah. 
yes, friends who understand and believe yes, that you should retire with some modicum of respect. Yes, sir. That you should, in your golden years, be able to live a life of respect. Yes, sir. Because we have people that we represent all across America who have done everything that society has asked them to do. Yes, you sir. grow up, get an education, get a job, pay into the system, help your fellow man, build up your family, give to the next person, care for your neighbor, and we expect the simple things in life yes, sir. to have some respect in our aging years. Yes, sir. And we have people in the Capitol, in these halls, who will take away pennies to the dollar from people who put in every day of their life. Yes, sir. Now, I represent the AFT. Uh, we represent 1.7 million people all across this country. Healthcare workers, public service workers, K-12 teachers, college and university professors. In fact, there are 50 million children who depend on our members every day to get what we do right in our classrooms. Sure. But in those 50 million children, we represent the teachers yeah. who care for those kids every day. Yes, sir. Those heartfelt teachers, 77% of them are women. Mm. They expect to retire yes, at some point because they have given a good life service. Yes, sir. Back to their community, back to our blocks, yeah. back to our country, back to our society yeah. to make us better than when they started. Yes, sir. And so all we're simply asking is to be fair. Be fair. Be fair to the folks that pay into a system. Yeah. Be fair to the government. Be fair to our democracy. Yes, be, fair, be, be fair to the idea that this is by, for, and about people. Yes. All the people, not the 435 of you, not the people who have more and want to give less. Not the people who don't need Social Security. Not the people who have a cap yeah. and don't pay as much as normal folks pay into a system. Yeah. This Fiscal Commission Act is a direct threat yes, to our society. Yes, sir. And so I want to thank again uh, Representative Larson. Uh, I will be brief today because you have heard all the issues that you need and you need to get into this capital. You got to put your shoes on, you got to get to a keyboard, you got to go visit some people, and you got to tell them, you got to speak truth to power, because that's what we do in the AFL-CIO and at the AFT. Yes, we speak truth to power. Yes, so as I close, Representative Larson, I will tell you, uh, we are in this fight. At the AFT, we will stand side by side with you to fight for Social Security and Medicare and against any national fiscal commission that would do them harm. Yes, sir. We're in this fight, we're in this fight, we're in this fight, and we're gonna do whatever it takes to make it right for people, for all the people. With that said, it is my pleasure to hand the mic to another champion in this fight, Kevin Tabaris, the National Secretary for the Postal Mail Handlers Union. Good morning. It is some morning, right? Well, I'm Kevin DeBarris. I'm the National Secretary Treasurer for the National Postal Mail Handlers Union. Our members work all, work all across this country of ours, processing and sorting mail. So if you mail it, we move it. So besides email, you can mail yeah, 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 yeah. to your representative. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm old school. Uh, so we all start our careers with the Mail Handlers Union, uh, with the Postal Service, thinking we're going to earn a living with benefits. Now, the idea of fiscal commissions have always started with really good intentions. Americans across the country often express concerns over federal spending and how it will impact them. Historically, fiscal commissions just result in targeting hard-working, middle-class citizens. In 2001, a fiscal commission recommended privatizing Social Security. Our members rely on Social Security as an important part of their retirement. This would be disastrous for those of us who rely on this benefit that they paid into their entire careers. The Simpson-Bowles Commission not only looked at raising the retirement age and changing how benefits are calculated, but it, it targeted postal and federal employees' paychecks. 
newly hired mail handlers now have to make greater contributions to their retirement than their older co-workers. And whenever there's talk of spending cuts, our members are often seen as low-hanging fruit, and we're not. Some people think that those of us who work for the Postal Service and the federal government are overpaid. And trust me, we're not. <laughs> our members are dedicated employees who serve their communities all over this great country and often are, have to live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. We are not the source of the federal deficit and we should not be the solution. Right there. I want to thank Congressman Larson for bringing this issue to light. And I want to thank my fellow union brothers and sisters for being here today. Yes, I'm glad to be standing here with people who I know who will also fight against the threats of a fiscal commission. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to turn it over to Congressman Larson. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank everybody. Just a couple of brief comments. Uh, people, uh, other people I want to mention and thank. Uh, Rich Neal, who will be the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I bet many people don't know that uh, Rich lost his father when he was a young man, uh, was dependent on his mother. Then he lost his mother. Uh, and after he lost his mother, his grandmother took care of him. And then he lost his grandmother as well. Mm. There's nobody who understands the impact that Social Security has better than Rich Neal, who is a thousand percent behind making sure that this commission does not go forward. So is Hakeem Jeffries as well. I have made right. it a point to go around to all of our leaders and talk to the Senate leaders as well. Because if this thing is going to slide in, it will slide in on some kind of must pass legislation. And we can't let that happen. That's right, sir. And that's why we've got to get that commitment. And then from every member who you can knock on. Now, I make these cards for every member of Congress mm. so that they know specifically, and I'm glad to share them with anyone who wants them, yes, so when you're knocking on their door, you can say, and oh, by the way, do you know how much money comes into your district monthly? Imagine cutting that by 20%. Do you know how many recipients you have in your district? And then breaking that down to pensions, spouses, dependents, and disability. And then getting out this message. We don't need a fiscal commission. What we need is a vote on extending the solvency yeah. of Social Security and Medicare and extending the benefits yeah. of Social Security yeah. because it hasn't been done yeah. in more than 50 years. Mm. Thank you for engaging us in this fight. No better time for the people's lobby to rise up and carry that message to the 435 members in the House and the 100 members in the Senate, it shouldn't be decided by seven members from both chambers. Thank you, and we'll take any questions if we haven't exhausted you already by uh, that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Bless you. Thank you, President